The Minecraft world is a huge and complicated place. There are mobs to find, vast structures to explore, and ancient pasts to rediscover. Yet throughout the world, there are mysterious forces that unite the unique groups. One such example is magic. Although we often take it for granted, it's not quite as simple as we may think. Welcome to Deep Dive, a series where we are slowly uncovering the hidden secrets of Minecraft. Tonight, we're going to take a look at magic, an often used but ill-understood part of the game. Throughout the Deep Dive series, we've slowly been uncovering the lore about various aspects of the game. Most of these have been looking at a specific mob, such as the piglins or illagers. However, in our discussions, we've unfortunately been lacking analysis on some of the much larger scale components of Minecraft. We've been focusing on the trees and forgetting about the forest in which they live. I do want to say that this video is best experienced if you've seen the Illager Deep Dive and the Wither Deep Dive, as I'll be covering topics from both of those. I highly recommend you watch those first. Minecraft is a world of rules, and to understand the game more deeply, we must also understand the rules which all entities follow. Magic is fundamental to how the Minecraft universe works. It's time for us to analyze it. Join me for a dive beneath the waves. Perhaps the best way to understand magic is to look at the things that are explicitly magical. The most obvious of this group is enchantment, which allows a user to take an ordinary item and infuse it with special properties. The main way that this is accomplished is through the use of the enchanting table. A player takes their equipment, puts it on the table along with some lapis, and enchants the weapon, consuming experience in the process. Although this seems pretty simple, it's actually quite complex, so let's break it down, starting with the enchanting table itself. The enchanting table requires three main components, obsidian, diamonds, and books. After construction, obsidian and diamonds are not used again. This seems to imply that they serve as stabilizers rather than some active ingredient. That's not the case for the book. In fact, the book is the primary connection between the person enchanting and the table itself. As a player approaches, the book willingly reveals its pages. Then, when the player puts an item in the slot, it flips to the appropriate page, revealing the possible enchantments. Although we don't know for sure what's happening from a lore perspective, the fact that there is text underneath the enchantment seems to imply that the player is reading the possibilities from this book. Yet this naive approach cannot be completely correct. Instead, the player has, at best, a loose translation of the text. They seem to be unsure of what exactly the enchantment process is going to do. There's a bit of a wild card here. There are a few ways we could go with this. One interpretation is that the magic is inherently chaotic, and that the actual enchanting process cannot be fully understood. However, I think there's a better option. Instead, what if the player simply lacks the knowledge to completely understand what the text says? The translation is essentially correct, but there's a chance to get even better enchantments than just that. In other words, the text is not flat out wrong, just not quite as descriptive as it could be. To more fully understand this, we must recognize a bizarre yet crucially important property of the table. The suggested enchantments are static until an enchantment is made. That means that, for each object type, the possible enchantments are limited until an option is chosen, upon which new possibilities are created. There's no way to reset this list without performing a new enchantment. Even stranger is the fact that this list of three exists irrelevant of which table or item is used. This seems to imply that the enchanting list is not a property of the table. Rather, it is somehow connected to the player themselves. The idea of the player having a deep connection to magical forces is something we'll look at more in a little bit, so keep this in the back of your mind as we continue. Let's go back to the idea of books. There's something we've neglected to mention thus far. Bookshelves surrounding an enchanting table increase the strength of the enchanting list. It's as though knowledge is being transferred into the table. We can even see an animation of the glyphs flowing from the bookshelves. And the connection doesn't end there. It's possible to enchant a book itself for later use. This gives further credence to the idea that there's something inherently powerful about the words themselves. Yet simply the words are not enough. Enchantment requires two more things, experience and lapis lazuli. Lapis is unique in the sense that it has no crafting uses beyond acting as a die. Rather, its primary gameplay mechanic is with enchanting. I view lapis as a catalyst, a necessary component for the enchantment to occur. We are unfortunately limited in detail about how this works since we really only use lapis for one thing, so for right now I'll take that as a given. On the other hand, experience is not so simple. Let's take a closer look and see if it can help us explain how magic works. Experience is a particularly strange quantity in Minecraft. The most common way to gain it is to kill mobs, releasing the experience stored within. But even though this is the most efficient method, we have to be careful about relying on it too heavily for our explanation. There are many other places in the Minecraft world where experience occurs naturally. For example, breeding animals drops experience, as does trading with villagers. 
It also seems to be tied to blocks. It can be obtained by mining coal and lapis. Furthermore, any type of smelting also generates experience. So although death and destruction is the most efficient way to gain it, it seems clear that it's not restricted to these extremes. Rather, experience is found throughout the Minecraft world. There are many different entities capable of storing experience. It occurs naturally in mobs and the player, but there do exist artificial storage devices. Bottles of enchanting are one example. Although the player does not know how to construct them, many other civilizations do. The ancient builders knew, since we find bottles in shipwrecks, and cleric villagers can trade them for emeralds. The bottles are also found in pillager outposts, which means that at least three distinct civilizations are or were aware of its existence. Because of this, it should be pretty obvious to us that experience is something that is physical in the Minecraft universe, not simply a gameplay mechanic. The locations we can find experience are far and wide, from blocks to animals. This leads me to one of the main points of this video. I view experience as a fundamental quantity in the Minecraft universe. It's somewhat analogous to energy in real life in several ways. First, it is conserved, which means that it is neither created nor destroyed. Second, it can take different forms. For example, a hand-cranked motor can turn mechanical energy into electrical energy, powering a light bulb. It's still energy, but it's been converted into charge and then released as light. I propose that the same idea is happening at the enchantment table. The experience stored within the player is converted into useful work by changing the form of the energy. It's still the same fundamental quantity, but it's useful in a different way, just as kinetic energy and electrical energy are used for different things. The grindstone all but confirms this by allowing us to disenchant and receive some experience back out of an object. Some of you may find an issue with this argument since the amount of experience we get back is not equal to the amount we put in. A similar issue occurs when the player dies. Why aren't all of the levels dropped on the ground, but only some of them? How can energy actually be conserved in this case? I would counter by saying that experience is conserved, but some of it is converted into forms that are not easily accessible. Working with experience causes some of it to get dispersed into the environment. It's similar to how friction works in real life. Energy is dispersed and lost as heat. It still exists, but not in a way where we can easily recover it. From the evidence we've discussed, we've learned that experience exists in many different places throughout the world, and it can be released under certain conditions. But there's still one thing we haven't quite understood yet which is why does so much of it become concentrated in living beings? The experience gained for killing a monster is much higher than that of smelting stone. Is that just the way it is? Or is there something deeper happening which we're missing? To understand this problem, we're going to talk about another form of energy which I discussed extensively in the Wither video. This is called soul energy. We discovered this by examining soul sand and realizing that there are screaming faces on the texture. I argue that these are literal souls. When using the Soul Speed Boots enchantment, we can see animations of little blue ghosts rising up and dissolving into the world, evidence of the soul energy that was in the soul sand. This soul energy can be put to use in many ways. For example, soul fire burns hotter than regular fire, using the souls in the sand as energy. But perhaps there's no greater use of soul energy than wither skeletons. I suggested that the wither status effect is the draining of life force, converting it into soul energy. In other words, any sentient being has some amount of soul energy just by being alive. The withering effect steals this and puts it into the soul sand. Under the right circumstances, this stored energy can be released in an incredibly powerful outburst. By building soul sand and wither skeleton skulls in the right configuration, a wither can be produced, causing untold destruction. Once it finally dies, it drops a nether star, which I said is a soul energy storage unit. This can be used to create a beacon, a powerful block which can provide positive status effects at a distance. There are other ways that soul energy can be used to cause status effects. We can understand this by taking a look at the second most common magical system in the game, potion brewing. Brewing uses a brewing stand, which can be crafted from stone and blaze rods. Each brew requires an ingredient and a catalyst, in a similar way to enchanting. In this case, the catalyst is heat in the form of blaze powder. Potion brewing is an iterative process, requiring several steps to make the most useful potions. The first step is to create an awkward potion using a nether wart. Remember, nether warts are created from soul energy, so any complex potion is ultimately powered, at least in part, by soul energy. The next step is to add the main ingredient to determine the primary effect. Every single one of these possibilities was alive at one point, from sugar to turtle shells to spider eyes. Perhaps this trait is what allows it to shape the soul energy into something useful. Afterwards, further ingredients can be added, such as redstone, to increase the time, or glowstone to increase the strength but they don't fundamentally change the potion in the same way that the mob drops do. So, unlike experience, soul energy has the restriction that it must be found in a living, dead, or undead entity, with the exception of soul sand. It's a far more specialized and restricted form of energy, and it doesn't appear latently as often as regular experience does. 
Nonetheless, there are definitely some similarities between the two that are worth considering. They can both be stored. They can both be used for practical purposes in the world, so long as a certain catalyst is present. As a more subtle point, they can both be used to gain more of itself. Constructing a wither will cause withering and drain as much soul energy as possible. Experience can be used to craft more powerful weapons, which, in turn, make it easier to gain more experience. These similarities may not be a coincidence. Experience and soul energy are so similar that we have to consider the idea that they're somehow two versions of the same thing, two sides of a singular energy coin. All known magic in Minecraft involves one of these two energies, so the obvious question is, can we find a way to convert from one to the other? Going from soul energy to experience is actually pretty easy. Killing a mob seems to instantly convert whatever soul energy it had into experience which can be easily collected. If soul energy is a more complex version which is only stable in certain situations, then it would make sense to revert into experience once the being storing it died. Now what about the other way? Can we convert from experience to soul energy? I think this is a very tricky thing to do, especially considering the multitude of restrictions applied to soul energy. Accomplishing this would require a vast amount of experimentation and probably specialized equipment to have any chance of pulling it off. Yet nonetheless, I believe that there is a group whose main purpose was to discover this conversion. I am, of course, talking about the Illagers. As I explained in my Illager deep dive, the pinnacle of their studies is the Totem of Undying. I made the argument that the Totem is fundamentally an experienced storage unit, and that raids were designed to charge up their Totems. Furthermore, the stored experience could be used for new types of magic. After our discussion today, it seems as though thinking of the Totem as an experienced battery only tells half of the story. The magical capabilities it enables are nothing like what we see experience do. It's not making a sword sharper, it's summoning ghosts from the void and exerting control over death itself. The totem does things that experience energy simply cannot do on its own. I believe that the Totem of Undying is the only item in Minecraft capable of harnessing both experience energy and soul energy. And here's why. It has the power to literally create souls by summoning vexes, which are the only ghost-like mob in Minecraft. Furthermore, one could interpret preventing death as generating a vast amount of soul energy, enough to keep someone alive. Think of it as the anti-withering effect. Oh wait, it actually does that by providing regeneration and absorption. Status effects are a soul energy trait found in potions and beacons. There's no way to do anything like this using just experience. This is the true achievement of the Illagers, the first known way to convert experience into soul energy and use them together. That's why their magic is so advanced. This realization puts many of their mysterious rooms in a new context. Take, for example, their giant wool statues. Is it possible that they are attempting to imbue them with soul energy and create life itself? Or what about the prison cells? Are they pushing the limits of soul energy by experimenting on villagers? The Ravager looks awfully similar to a villager. Could this be caused from a twisted soul energy experiment? Or their disturbing altars? What better way is there to learn about soul energy than by killing innocent beings? We now have an explanation as to why the totem is so powerful, which was something that I lacked in my previous video. It adds the final puzzle piece, allowing us to really see what can happen with these energies. However, there's still a few questions that we need to address when putting this all together. One such oddity is why soul energy seems to be much more prominent in the nether than the overworld. I think the answer is that soul energy is more closely tied to heat than experience. It typically requires a certain temperature to be stable. Almost any living animal would satisfy this requirement, explaining their capability of storing it. In potion brewing, blaze powder provides the heat. But beyond that, the rest of the overworld is far too cool on average. The nether does not have this problem. Instead, it's extremely hot, which is why I think soul energy shows up here more naturally. It's just so much better suited to having it develop, which is why withering effects and so many crucial potion components are exclusive to the nether. There's simply more time for the effects of soul energy to cause adaptations. As with every video, I encourage you to think about this critically and don't just blindly take my word for it. A lot of this does depend on whether or not you accept the idea of soul energy. The method for getting stored in soul sand is somewhat ambiguous, and I talked about this issue in more detail in the Wither video. Another thing that makes soul energy tricky is that although we can see evidence of it, it's not as explicit as experience, which has a number. I think this goes back to soul energy being more specialized and less stable. From a gameplay perspective, it wouldn't make sense to have the primary experience mechanic be connected only to death. They would want a way to encourage other things like villager trading. Anyways, there we have it. Hopefully this video helped tie together some of the things between other deep dives. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Have I made a compelling case, or do you see the world in a different way? Also, feel free to join us on the RGN subreddit as well as the Discord. People have come up with some great ideas, and I really love interacting with this community. 
There are so many comments that I can't read all of them, so the Discord and subreddits are a great place to go if you have a good idea. We'll end with that. This has been Retro Gaming Now. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next episode.